dodge this. One world currency. The new world order. Those are the roots of trouble. I imagine that right now you're feeling a bit like Alice. Tumbling down the rabbit hole? Hmm? Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life. That there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind, driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill, the story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. All I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. Well, we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of election, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. But I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people. And now, welcome to another episode of Down the Rabbit Hole. Here's your host from federaljack.com. It's Popeye. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another live edition of DTRH. I am your host, Popeye, from federaljack.com. PopeyeRadio.com and of course DTRH Radio Archives over on YouTube. That's DTRH Radio Archives over on YouTube. So we are back with another live edition. It is July 20th, 2016. Tonight I'm going to be airing an off air interview I did with Detective John Shirley. You all remember him, he's been on the show. Numerous times over the past five years. He's a retired homicide detective from Houston, Texas. And he's going to be joining me again tonight to discuss the shootings in Dallas. And the push for martial law, the division in this country. The end game. Order out of chaos. John and I did this interview July 11th within a few days of the Dallas police shootings and he was kind of a prophet in that during the broadcast he said you're going to see this happen again and again and again and I wouldn't be surprised if you see this happen again very soon and within a few days the officers in Baton Rouge were killed so it's very timely and I think it's very important for people to hear this broadcast, have a better understanding of what's going on. Again, order ab KO. Order out of chaos. Although it's not really order, it's just their version of order. It's their agenda that they've already had. It's not new, and it's certainly not order in reference to the New World Order or at least their idea of what that should be. Anyway, without further ado, let's get right to my interview with Detective John Shirley on the Dallas police shooting, the division in this country, and the end game of order out of chaos. Here we go. On this special edition of DTRH, I am welcoming back my good friend, Mr. John D. Shirley, detective retired. 
I like to say uh, retired now because I'm sure John appreciates the fact that he's retired. If you're not familiar with who Detective John Shirley is, he's been on the broadcast many times before. John and I have had some epic conversations. And they're always informative to the general public, especially from somebody who doesn't maybe understand cops other than what they've seen on TV, the Internet, and or if they've had a bad experience with a police officer. John gives cops a good name. But he is now retired and actually even freer to speak his mind. You know, you, you do have some, some restraints when you're still active duty, and you have to, especially the amount of time he put in. You don't want to be messed with. But now John's a little bit freer to speak his mind. And I've been wanting to get him on, actually, for a while. I, I've been wanting to get Detective Shirley on for again for quite some time because uh, of everything that's been going on. In fact, him and I called this the last couple shows we did together, conversations with a comp. Him and I called this. We, we we explained how this game was being played and how this plan was being fomented. And here we are now. And now you actually see what we called out. We actually called some of the events that have happened out. It, it's really, it, it, I hate being right is the only way I could put it. Anyway, so, you know, we're going to discuss Dallas. We're going to discuss the division in this country, the divide between uh, police and regular citizens, the the reason that's being done, which we've talked about before, how all of a sudden the police state is being sold to the general public and everybody loves it. We're going to get into that. And we're going to talk about Scalia's death because I wanted to talk to John about that, too, so we're going to get into that later. Because this is all actually, it, it, it's all part of a much larger agenda. You'll see how it all links up. Anyway, let me bring him to the airwaves again, and then we'll get into all of this. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let me welcome back to the airwaves my good friend, Detective John Shirley. John, welcome back, my brother. Well, thank you for having me back, Popeye. I seriously appreciate it. So... The world has gone crazy since the last time you were on. Uh, unfortunately, but I have to say it was predictable. <laughs> you know, that wasn't hyperbole when I said in the uh, the intro there that you and I had talked about this before. You and I have talked about this on numerous occasions. In fact, we pretty much called what is going on right now. We said that this was going to be done. For And we, we laid out the reasons. I mean, they're, they're literally selling the police state to people. And people are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, two years ago, you couldn't have gotten somebody to be behind the cops having body armor and end wraps and armored personnel carriers and stuff. They would have been like, no, they don't need that crap. That's nuts. We've never had a problem with that. All of a sudden now, after the events that just transpired. But we'll, we'll get into all that. So before we even jump into the deep end of the... The conspiracy police state pool. How are you, my friend? I'm good. I'm living the the great retired, non-retired life uh, in North Texas. Not Houston anymore. And how is North Texas treating you? It's good. It's hot right now, but uh, it's not Houston. I spent uh, my entire life, with the exception of about the last year and a half, in uh, Houston. And uh, it's good to be away from that. Now I'm a little bit of a distance away from uh, Fort Worth, Texas, and I'm probably 40 miles as the crow flies, and that's about as close as I need to be, especially given what's been going on here in the last few weeks. So how crazy is Texas with everything that's going on there? I, I know that you're, you know, you're closer to Dallas. Um, I mean, you're not right there, but you, you, you're closer to Dallas than I am. So... What what's the the feel? I mean, not I'll, I'll get your your take on you know on the cop beat, but just as a citizen of Texas, what's the what's it feel like right now with everything that's happened there? It's uh, the feeling is stay out of the city. Nobody wants to go to town anymore, which is uh, understandable and probably cons- I'd consider it advisable because they're worried about being shot by police, being shot by protesters, being caught in a melee. <laughs> All of the above. They're, it's it's coming from all sides, and it's just enough chaos to spook uh, to spook people who don't have to go into the city to stay away. And uh, and I know that if you're not having to go to work there, you're not going there. And that's I think that's what we can expect for the foreseeable future. That's going to jack the city's economy up. 
Yeah, it will. It will absolutely. Um, and th there's no there's no uh, reasonable end in sight. And people better buckle up because this is this is what we can expect going forward. And I don't I don't see uh, the end of it potentially in my lifetime. I could I could hope, but I don't expect it. Do you see a division amongst the your fellow Texans? You know, I have to say, for the most part, everybody's just kind of a, in a in a hunkered down wait and see wait and see thing. But there's there's really not uh, there's not real strong feelings either way. I mean, I think it's one of those deals where people understand the frustrations of the black community, but what they don't understand is the way the response is being handled. And I'm, my, my my opposing viewpoint to that is the people in the inner city are fed up, and they don't understand why everyone else isn't as pissed off as they are. And uh, so you've got a you've got a definite dividing line, but there's kind of a quiet calm right now, and everybody's just kind of waiting for the next shoe to drop. And uh, we'll see how it goes. Okay, so now, what's the scuttlebutt on the police end? <clears throat> Well, as as you can expect, the, the you know the police being the subculture that that they are, um, they're keeping their head down, and uh, at the same time, even your most jaded, you know, twenty five year police officers, they don't want to see their cities be torn to shreds, and and the cops aren't happy about this either. Um, their viewpoint may be a little bit different. Than the Black Lives Matter uh, group is, but they still don't like the chaos, and they don't like to uh, to know that more so than even a normal day, they could go home or leave leave and go to work, and uh, be reported on the news in a in a mass shooting incident. And uh, I think going forward, we're going to see this repeated. Ho hopefully not regularly but i could see it happening regularly and that's the 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 regularity of it aspect is what kind of really scares me uh for our for our nation as a whole do you think police are going to change their tactics with the way that they deal with the general public during traffic stops and protests and the like because of this i wish they wouldn't but they're going to um your your first indication is to batten down the hatches and uh, and sharpen that edge even sharper, and uh, and it's it's nobody wins in this, and that's what's well. I say nobody, nobody in the public wins. Uh, the system wins because we're more easily controlled when we're scared and when we're segregated and when we're pointing fingers at each other. And so, for maybe the powers that be. There's a silver lining to this chaos, but uh, for Black Lives Matter, for police, for everyone else, it's a losing game. Ordo ab chaos. Mm -hmm. Order exactly. out of chaos. They already have the order that they want, John. They just need the chaos as the excuse to then bring it about. And they're doing that. They're doing a really good job of it. You and I discussed this, the division, the chaos that's being created on purpose. I I did a show on this last year, and I actually reposted it the other day. And it's titled Racism, Revolution, and the King Alfred Plan. And I did it on uh, back in January, the beginning of January of 2015. And I played an episode of an old researcher from May, named May Brussel. And she did a show about a thing called the King Alfred plan, which people thought was fictional it came out of a book from the fifties. But I spoke to a few old black Panthers, like original black Panthers after I did my first show on it like five years ago when I first started radio and they heard the broadcast and they contacted me uh, multiple different ones. And I was able to verify who they were. And they said to me, without a shadow of a doubt, that that thing was real. They they feel that the King Alfred plan was real. And I said, well, the show I did on it, I broke down, and the one I did last year, I broke it down again, how the King Alfred plan, 
the which was pretty much Rex eighty four in the United States in the, in this book it was written up that the King Alfred plan was uh, pretty much Rex eighty four in the case of civil unrest but not regular civil unrest race war and it laid out how they would you know like how it was broken down how it would go from the local cops to the state police to the the feds and the military uh, it, it, and it how they're going to break up the country into 10 different regions 10 different regions and this isn't like the late 50s this the book i think it was called the man who cried i am was the name of the, the fictional book that this was in but some have said that this plan was real now may thought the plan was real and a lot of these are old school black panther activists like real old school black panthers uh, that had contacted me thought the same thing they said no it was real now when you read the king alfred plan and you you see what it says and like how it's laid out you're like wow that's got like disturbingly similar aspects to it that rex 84 and fema camps and stuff and then you realize Wow, I wonder if they were putting this out there, you know, to get people used to that idea. There's, you know, how they do that with predictive programming and uh, and the like to to get people to accept things, uh, you know, incrementally. But anyway, I looked at this and I saw similarities between Rex eighty four and the King Alfred plan, and I, I I see it going on today. And I discussed this last year, and then you and I did shows for the past like two years about this. And we have discussed numerous times how there's this huge divide in the country and it's being fomented on purpose to create division and anxiety and hatred. Like, I know there's, <clears throat> we've had racism. I know racist idiots, right? We've all met them in our lives here or there. But up until a few years ago, and it, I, I want to say a few years ago it hit the crescendo around Ferguson is when things really started getting the gasoline tanker being backed up to the the house fire, so to speak. But ever since Obama became the president, their tactic, the administration's tactic and his supporters have always been blame racism. Like if you don't agree with Obama, it's because you're racist because he's black. And like during that period of time, like, I mean, there was a lot of people I know that were like, wow, you know, we've moved past our racial bias in this country. We elected a black president. That's gone. That's gone. And like, where did that go in this short period of time? How did we, how did we, uh, over the span of seven years, lose that? How did we get to where we're at now? Manipulation, that's how. Because they started crying racism from the door. And at first, people didn't take it seriously. They would call it, you know, a political move, or they'd call it name calling, or whatever they'd want to call it. Now, you know, now it's graduated beyond that and beyond logical fallacy level. It's actually graduated to the point where it's helped stoke this fire. And I'm not saying that there that the black community doesn't have any valid reason to be pissed off. They they most certainly do. They've been screwed with for generations and generations. I ha- I'm not saying that, but this hatred and division amongst the people itself, like we're all humans. Seriously, they, this this is not, we weren't here eight years ago. It wasn't to this vitriolic level that we're at now. Now it's to the point where people want to kill one another over the dumbest of shit. You know, it's crazy. Well, what say you, John? Well, I think we've come to a place in our nation and, and the relations between the police and citizens, specifically inner city citizens or, city, or urban citizens, has reached a point where it really no longer matters if a police action, a shooting, or use of force uh, situation, it doesn't any longer matter if it's justified or not. <clears throat> the relations have degraded to the point where if the police act and there's force used and it's on video because pretty much everything's on video these days, the police are automatically in the wrong. Now, granted, there are situations like Eric Garner in New York City uh, a year ago or so, where he was essentially murdered for se- for selling single cigarettes and not paying the right amount of taxes on it. There are definite situations where the police overreact and where they murder basically innocent people. Um, but the reality is, and if you, you can check it longitudinally, 
most use for situations in the end are justified, even if they look bad. Uh, that doesn't give an excuse for, for a bad shooting or a bad use of force. But it, the, the relations have degraded to the point where it doesn't matter anymore. And so I don't know. I can't tell you what the, the shootings that took place in Baton Rouge and I guess it was Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It doesn't matter now if those were good shootings or not. We've, we've boiled it down to a point where the Black Lives Matter supporters, no matter what the police do, they're going to they're going to see racism and they're going to see uh, unjustified force. Now, I will say encouragingly, there's really not as many people on the flip side of that. There's not as many people who are willing to just rubber stamp police action as the greatest thing since sliced bread. Um, so in that way, I'm encouraged. At least we've reached a point now where police action isn't uniformly um, covered up. And, and that's kind of where. I find the Black Lives Matter people kind of giving us a straw man argument that we're still living in the 1950s where, you know, no matter how badly a police officer screws up, it's going to be covered up and, and it's going to be made, made to be go, made to go away. Um, but all that doesn't matter now because it's degraded to the point where the Black Lives Matter and associated groups and supporters are going to find any police action as an excuse to, to march, which is their right, but it's also an excuse for them to use rhetoric that ends up pushing people over the edge, uh, people who were probably unstable to begin with. And uh, it leaves us with what happened in Dallas the other day. And unfortunately, the powers that be in our government, specifically Obama and his administration, <clears throat> no matter what they're what the followers of Black Lives Matter say, um, they're not going to call a spade a spade. They're not going to say this was beyond the pale, there's no excuse, there's nothing. The response is always a measured response with some placation uh, to the violence uh, or, or their reasoning for the violence at least. They won't come out and say they were right to, they were right to get shot. They, they weren't, they're not going to say the police deserve being shot, but they're going to placate – the Black Lives Matter side. So even the ones that aren't necessarily calling for violence, it makes them feel a little bit better about what happened. Um, because no matter what what uh, what they want to what people want to say, that nobody in Dallas was cheering on the the fact that cops were being killed. Well, I've seen multiple reports that it that it was happening, um, and it's that rhetoric that's going to end up leading to, to future situations like this. And, and the police are going to be forced to respond. Um, we're not going to, the police, the police culture are not going to allow sniping of officers to go unresponded to. And, and functionally that what that means is you're going to see police with a little heavier handed tactics because that's the, that's the logical response. And, uh, and that's going to lead to more division between the police in the inner city. And that's going to lead to more people willing to go out and shoot a cop or stab a cop in the neck like the cartoon that's been on the Facebook and all over the Internet. It's going to lead to that. And, uh, and I, I, I don't think it's all an accident. I think we, we've, we got here because we were on a path to get here. And uh, we just happened to reach the first waypoint, real waypoint along that path. And, uh, and more of it's coming. Without a doubt. Yeah, and they're going to keep fomenting it. You, you notice, now I know you see the Black Lives Matter protesters, you know, out protesting and stuff, but if you notice, you, you don't see Al Sharpton. You don't see, I think Jesse Jackson made some stupid comment the other day, but he's another agitator. Go, go look at the, the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. and ask yourself why Jesse Jackson had his blood on him. And why he smeared it on himself, and why he's such an opportunistic scumbag. But that's that's a whole other separate issue. Anyway, you know, people like him and Sharpton were talked about, by the way, in that broadcast that May did about the King Alfred plan. How uh, the the selling out of the black community was done after Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated by having people that were controlled 
put into positions of power into that activist community and people like Jesse Jackson. And then you have people like nowadays you have Al Sharpton, all controlled opposition. And where do you see them, by the way, on the Dallas shooting? Have they come out and said, I abhor what happened? It's abhorrent that officers were sniped and we shouldn't be doing this and we should be, we're supposed to be loving one another. No, you won't see them come out. But on the opposite side, if a black teenager, black male, whoever is killed by a police officer, uh, whether or not the shooting is justified or not, Sharpton will come out and create chaos and foment the anger on the one side, but he won't come out and try to turn it down and try to, you know, alleviate some of that anger. If Obama, if any of these people really cared about any community and cared about the nation as a whole, they would come out and they would urge people to calm the F down. I mean, they would they would really come on TV and instead of saying, you know, something like, oh, this could have been my son like Obama, like trying to foment the anger and the emotion. See, they always play to the emotion. That's the logical fallacy. They go for the appeal to emotion. Well, if... If they really cared, if they really wanted to stop this, they would come on and they would say, everybody needs to calm down. Seriously, everybody needs to calm down and relax. And we need to look at this very logically and sensibly. And we need to stop all this rhetoric and propaganda. But the rhetoric and propaganda come out mainly from the side that wants this to be a bigger issue. And that's the people that actually pull the levers. You know, side C. There's always A and B, they tell you. There's only a choice of one side or the other, right? Which is what they've narrowed everything down to. But that's not really the way it is. And, you know, you and I discussed this as well on another broadcast, and I did another show about this the other, uh, probably about a month or two ago, and I cut the, the segment out where I discussed this, and I put it on YouTube. The And I mentioned this earlier. And this has been going on for a while, but the the anger that we see today was really fomented and the gasoline was poured onto the fires around the time of Ferguson. And I think it was done for a multitude of reasons. One of them is because they want to nationalize the police, which is what I see this whole mess leading to, which we can get into. But they also need a divide and conquer tactic to keep people from realizing that we are actually all similar and in this together because right around the time of Ferguson, if you remember, not too long before that was when Anaheim, California had their little problem and the cops were running around dressed like spec ops and they were running around with BDUs and everything on and it was hard to tell who was a cop and who was, you know, an army ranger, right? So you had that going on and people were going, martial law? Why do cops have MRAPs? Why do cops need armored personnel carriers? Why, why is the, the government giving away surplus military equipment? If I mean, even congressmen were questioning this and saying, why are we doing this? You know, should we be doing this? Maybe this isn't such a smart thing to be doing. These police departments don't have the money to have the upkeep and maintenance on these vehicles. They don't have the training on how to properly operate them, amongst other things. Maybe we shouldn't be doing this. Remember those conversations, John? I know you do because we talked about stuff like this when you would come on and do conversations with a cop. Remember those? Absolutely, and uh, to me, it's uh, you know uh, we let's 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 find a find a let's we have a solution. Let's find the problem we can stick it to, and uh, and so they started arming the police with military weapons and military gear, dressing them like military. But to me, that's really kind of just the the icing on the cake for it. I mean, the, I try to look back and find out where this all started. Where did this begin? And and, and from a police perspective, um, I look back in the early 90s when I started uh, in my career in law enforcement, and, you know, there was a little bit of the milita- militarization of the police, somewhat, but it was really more of a an excuse for esprit de corps in the beginning. And then slowly throughout my career, it was ever so slowly uh, ramped up, and uh, the training changed and the tactics changed, how we deal with people, how we're trained to deal with people changed a little bit, and the, the subculture changed. And so you start having officers feeling like they're the occupying force in a lot of these cities. And, and I, would, I would lie to tell you that those specific words weren't spoken. 
uh, between officers, and I guarantee they're spoken today between officers, that they feel and are, and are almost or tacitly encouraged to be an occupying force in these cities. And they're pushed to, to enforce, in the grand scheme of things, silly laws. Um, and, and that kind of takes me takes me back to the whole concept of policing. Uh, you know, the last 40 years, 50 years, it's all everybody's been holding hands and saying we we push community policing. I'm going to tell you right now, community policing is a farce, an absolute farce. Um, it's a feel good measure to try to make the communities they they protect. Try to make them feel better about the way they're being policed. But the actual tactics of policing have gotten more restrictive and more aggressive and more punitive. And, uh, and what really needs to happen, and you know, if you want to look for, for a solution to the issue with the people and the police, we need to get the police away, in my opinion. We need to get away from proactively enforcing misdemeanor law. It's the very concept of misdemeanor offense – the whole concept of misdemeanor is it's minor. It's not a big deal. It's an infraction of a minor law. But what's happened is the police have been funneled into strongly enforcing misdemeanor law. The majority of these, co- of these confrontations that end up being the headlines and end up being the fuel for the Black Lives Matter movement, if you look at them, Eric Garner is the prime example of that. He was selling cigarettes without paying the taxes correctly. What that shows me is with the way that our police are set up, if you get a parking ticket and you resist that parking ticket and you say, I'm not going to pay that parking ticket, and you take it to its logical conclusion, I'm not going to pay this ticket, eventually the government is going to kill you. And it's that comes from a place of, we're going to enforce every single law we can as strongly as we can. And that does nothing but degrade the, the, the feeling of the community toward the police. And it ends up with the police having a militarized, hunkered-down mentality. And we end up with that boiling point, that line in the sand. And if we would take the police and refocus them to focus on felony, felony charges, felony, and felony lawbreakers – we would find we, our, our relations with the community would, would improve. And that goes along with the whole idea of real community policing. Real community policing, in my opinion, is taking the community you serve, and I emphasize the word serve. You take the community you serve, and you find out at, at, a, at a certain level, how do they want to be policed? You know, in my neighborhood, if my, if my grass is over a certain number of inches, I get an infraction – in a lot of cities, they have similar laws to that, where you can get ticketed and actually put in jail for for having your grass too long. If a community says we don't want to enforce that as much, the police should respect that because at the at the very base level, the laws and the whole construction of our government and our whole society is based upon the consent of the governed. Well, as a community, if they don't consent to being policed in an aggressive fashion, if they don't consent to have the misdemeanor laws – enforced strongly well then that's their right and 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 while and while it may be unrealistic to tell the police you can't enforce misdemeanor law because it's still a law in the books and there's a there's a way to fix that what you can say is our community is not going to allow for the aggressive enforcement of these misdemeanor minor not a big deal infractions and if you take that that uh, fuse and you put that fuse out your interactions between the police and the public are going to get better because nobody's going to defend a rapist. Nobody's going to defend a murderer. Nobody's going to get upset if a child rapist fights with the police and they have to get kind of heavy handed with him to get, to get him under, under control. That those problems, those issues, people don't have a problem with, but when you start roughing people up for a joint or you rough them up for some other misdemeanor infraction, a minor law, law, infraction that's when you get the public pissed off um and then when you look at how officers take minor misdemeanor infractions and in this case i want to speak specifically about traffic infractions and they use it as a constant pretext to get to somewhere else and i'm going to use a, i'm going to use my own my own experience to that um i was a young officer and i was 
not as hopefully wise as I am today. In I, the only reason I even stopped people on traffic was because I was looking for a pretext to be able to search their vehicle because a, a pretty fair percentage of the people I stopped had narcotics or weapons or whatever. And so I, I would use the traffic code to then find a legal reason, but it's still just finding a reason to find something bigger. Um, and I'm telling you, for all the people that I stopped and, and I didn't end up searching for more or I didn't end up finding legitimate higher charges, they left with a bad taste in their mouth. And, uh, and so it's, it, you got to look at the big picture. And the big, big, big picture is we've cast our police in a role they were never meant to fill in, in a lot of ways. And this includes the, the aggressive enforcement of mis- misdemeanor infractions. I, I wish we could look and see the uh, someone would do a study on the enforcement rate of misdemeanor crime uh, decade by decade from, let's say, 1900. And look, and I can tell you right now, the amount of misdemeanor infractions based upon the population, I guarantee it is probably a thousand percent what it was a hundred years ago. Um, and you also have to consider the fact that we've got how many more times the number of laws now, especially minor misdemeanor laws, than we did 100 years ago. And that's a, to me, in my, my viewpoint, that's a direct line to where we find ourselves today. And, and, uh, and it's, gonna take a, it's gonna take a sea change in, in, in the policing model in the United States to see any appreciable improvement. And it's gonna take a long time to fix because there's a lot of distrust in the, uh, the minority community and most of that distrust is deserved. Um, p- the police have lost their way. Uh, they've lost their way from from peace officer and peacekeeper and problem solver to, for lack of a better thing, jackbooted enforcer. And that's the way they're viewed. And in a lot of ways, that's the way they should be viewed. Um, and I was guilty of it too early in my career. Um, so that's that's kind of my five minutes worth of uh, speechifying on the on, on this part of this uh, mess we find ourselves in. That losing of the way, the m- militarization of the police force, instead of having them be one with the community, but that, that militarization thereof of the police force itself, everybody started noticing that. And before Ferguson, everybody, and I'm not saying that there wasn't racial issues, but that stuff was really at a a, a much... The flame was much, much lower. It was a tiny little nothing flame, you know. And suddenly you have things being exacerbated because everybody started noticing one commonality. That it didn't matter who was doing the, the infraction, whether it was a black guy, a white guy, you know, a little Chinese lady, old white lady. I mean, they, they shot a woman in a parking lot of a church because she wouldn't sign a ticket she rolled the window up and tried driving away and the cop stuck his arm in and got stuck and shot her and killed her this is a couple years ago you could look this up so everybody was starting to realize hey wait a minute maybe, maybe those conspiracy theorists aren't wrong in fact i believe it was msnbc it was either them or cnn but i want to say it was msnbc that made that comment it's like one of the headlines or one of the things one of the commentators said are are those conspiracy theorists right? You know, could they be right about the police state? And everybody started to notice that, John. And everybody started to notice, you know, hey, you know, it's not just the minorities that are getting effed with. See, as as crappy as this sounds, and this is truthful, white class, white white middle class America did not really pay too much attention. Uh, to the woes of anybody else in the country as long as it wasn't affecting them. And I'm not picking on anybody. I'm not disparaging. I was part of that where I just, when I was younger, I didn't, I mean, I I knew about inequities and things like that um, and inequalities of people, you know, between different, you know, different races or classes of people you want to say in this. But I think the whole racism and classism thing is bullshit. But anyway... We're just one race, the human race. If we could just understand that, things would be much better on this planet. But I digress. So I I understood a lot of that. But when I was a kid, 
you're, you know, I mean, I, I grew up hanging out with um, a rougher crowd, so I was exposed to certain things, and I understood stuff, but I just never liked, I, I never liked authority or police to begin with. So to me, it was always like, eh, not, you're, you're not one of my favorite figures to begin with. So there's that. But I, I still wasn't exposed to the degree of disparity between getting screwed with by police um, be, you know, as to opposed to some of my black friends or my Hispanic friends until I was a little bit older. And then I started to notice it. And I was like, hmm, you know, I don't get screwed with, but I'm willing to bet if, you know, I was so-and-so, they would, they would probably mess with me because my friends were having, you know, more experiences like that. But it was still a slower progression of the police state. So nobody was paying attention. And then... And then everybody started to. After 9-11, things, you know, the it was there before 9-11, but the ramping up of the police state kicked into high gear. And they dropped it into overdrive on September 11th, 2001. So now everybody is starting to pay attention. And they're saying, why do cops have MRAPs, John? Why do they, why do they need BDUs? We don't need that. That's, that's the cops aren't military. There's, there is actually a distinct difference between police and military. When cops say civilian, they, they're civilians. There's only military and civilian, and the police are civilians. But they get the cops to use the term civilian, and they keep using that nomenclature. And like John said, you end up thinking you're a different class of individual. And that's done on purpose by the powers that shouldn't be. So it, it, there's so many reasons. It just it, one, it, It's like one of the things they teach you in the military is dehumanization you dehumanize your enemy well in this case the police are a different class than the people they look over so it's a little bit easier to deal with us sheep us cattle you understand so everybody started to realize that wow we all have one huge major thing in common besides being humans and we should stop being idiots to each other we're all getting treated the same way by by the cops what, what what's up with that and then ferguson happened and the argument went from MRAPs to black versus white. It went from the police state and police brutality being perpetrated on everybody to cops only beat up blacks, Latinos, and minorities, and they don't mess with white people. And I, I know back in the day, there might again, there might have been a disparity, but now it's to the point, like Russell Means said, welcome to the reservation. It's all of us. This whole country is already pretty much a FEMA camp. People just don't realize it yet. And the prison is already there. We, I don't, just, people just haven't realized it. So you see this going on, and I've, I, we've been saying this for a while, and I, I've been preaching about this, I want to say, for like a year, saying, look, the division has been, I mean, it's been going on, that was there. But the racial anger, the racial division, the level that you can feel it at right now, the gasoline tankers report onto the house fire at Ferguson and afterwards, ever since. And it's been just high gear pushing this because they want a civil war. They want a race war. What better of a way to divide this country? What better of a way? You know, the original civil war, ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I maybe you don't know this, but the original civil war wasn't the... You know, oh, it's all the states' rights. Bullshit. It was about tearing this country apart. And the powers that shouldn't be coming in and cleaning up what was left. Luckily, that didn't happen. You can also thank the Russians partially for that because they, they their navy helped out greatly. I know, I know. History. You actually have to read. Turn off YouTube. You can look up look up this stuff on YouTube. But I suggest you look this stuff up on whatever search engine you want. Find some different videos and stuff, but try to find books and read. Read real history, because that's the only way we're not going to repeat it, ladies and gentlemen. Anyway, so the Civil War was really about breaking this country up, because this country is strong to an outside invader. I've said this before. It's like General Hamamoto, the guy that was in charge of the invasion of Pearl Harbor, right? And uh, he said he would never dream of invading the mainland United States because there would be a gun behind every blade of grass. And he knew that people would have not only the guns, but the will 
and the expertise to use it and defend this country, and they would. It doesn't matter if they're black, white, red, purple. People would band together. That's the one thing about this country. We might fight amongst ourselves, but you come from the outside and try to mess with us, and you know, we'll knock your dick in the dirt, as they say. It's very easy to get around that if you understand that that's the prevailing mentality. You can actually use that to manipulate the society into doing exactly what you want them to do to begin with. And that's what they're doing. Because they can't come in from the outside, so they get us. They use the idea of an outside threat, but they get us to look at each other like the outside threat and be divided on so many different levels, political, sexual, religious. It doesn't matter. Like We have to argue. Everybody has to fight. That, that's the main thing that they push. Notice there's no logic push. The arguments are never a real debate. The argument is always appeal to emotion or red herrings, or straw man arguments. Logical fallacies, I've done shows on this before, the use of logical fallacies, ladies and gentlemen, means you don't have a valid argument. So why are why is the media doing it? Why is the government doing it? You have to ask yourself that. You have to understand these basics to be able to see through the bullshit. Because that's what's going on right now. They use appeal to emotion for everything. They use red herrings. They, they use straw man arguments. And you need to pay attention to this. You need to be able to see that this is going on. They're manipulating this entire situation. And they, it doesn't mean I think the shootings are fake either. The shootings are very real. They just have the media focus on it. And then they have pundits come out and stoke the fires by saying certain things on certain shows. And the next thing you know, you have people rioting. They know how to get that anger that's already there you know, boiling over. And they're 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 basically like turning the pot of boiling water on and then walking away from the stove. They're not even minding it. They don't care because they need that chaos. They already know how they're going to deal with it. Don't think that they don't know how they're going to deal with it. What do you think Rex 84 is for? What do you think that active duty army unit, and it's like 20,000 men and women, but 20,000 soldiers, we'll say, at, at least I believe. I'd have to look into it, the numbers. It's been a couple of years, but just look up active duty army unit in the United States for martial law, and you'll see what I'm talking about. What do you think those people are for? What do you? I mean, there's there's so much evidence to see they they already have the answer to their chaos. They just need to create the chaos, and they're doing a great job of it. They're getting people to hate each other for the stupidest of reasons, dumbest of reasons, and the division is so deep and so thick. I mean, I thought it was bad the last time you and I talked about this, John, but holy shit, it has gone off the deep end. It really has, has it not? It absolutely has. And, and to, for me, what I'm scared about is what if you take a situation like Dallas and you say that same thing happens once a week for the next month? We're talking martial law. That, that is the response. And I would like to say a nice little sidebar there is no provision for martial law in our Constitution. Um, but that being said, what will happen in this nation if you get a repeat of Dallas or something on that magnitude happening a few times, several times in a short amount, in a short period, two or three weeks, and you're going to have martial law declared. And, uh, and then all bets are off. I don't know where we'll end up when that happens. Um, and the further divided we get, the more your people are going to fall into their camps because people are pack animals by, by nature. You're going to have the people who are the pro-control, and you're going to have the people that are fighting the establishment. And, uh, and, and that's, it's going to break out. And, and the last thing that, that any reason a person wants to see is a race war in this country or a war based around the perceived idea of a race war. And uh, – it, but the, the thing is, it's all connected. I mean, you've got the militarization of the police. You've got um, the stoking of the of the race division. You've got the private prison complex. You've got the, the crazy enforcement of misdemeanor laws. You have the crazy enforcement of, of, of minor drug laws. All of this stuff is rolling together down the same road. And... What they're pushing us toward is more control. Uh, what they're pushing us toward is a police state. 
and in the, the public is buying it hook, line, and sinker on all sides of the equation. Um, and I don't see how we're going to stop it at this point. Um, it even includes things like the education system over the last hundred years, how we dumb, dumb people down. People don't think for themselves. They don't question. They, they, they look at the television. They watch the pre-programmed controlled TV shows and movies that, that, that train us that – Government, the government does no wrong, or if the government does wrong, it's because we have a small rogue faction that's that's just going, you know, going off the reservation. When in reality, to a large extent, our whole government system is the rogue element, um, and we're being puppeteered into a situation where the government will have an excuse to take away our rights. And you can throw that into any category you want. You can say police state. You can say they're going to try to disarm the public. You can say whatever. But the reality is the end result, the end game, is ultimate control of the people um, in, the stri- in, in the excused stripping away of rights. And when it comes to the, you know, the global government, when it comes to the police state, when it comes to a global currency, all of that stuff people need to realize is that the government is not going to give us those things kicking and screaming. The government is going to manufacture what happens to the level where we beg for it. When they drop the bomb, drop the, the hammer on martial law in our country, it's going to be because a large segment of the population is begging for it. Please take control. Please reestablish control. I just want to be able to go buy my six-pack of beer and watch my episode of whatever the TV show of the month is. They just want to get their life back in order, and so they just want the government to take control and make sure that they can live their life in what they conceive as freedom, which, in my opinion, is is a sham. It's a, it's a fallacy. Um, we, we are bled to believe we are free, uh, but we're not any more free than probably 80% of the rest of the world. Um, we're just told we are, and we tell each other we are, and we sing ni- nice jingoistic songs about how free we are. When the reality is every year, every month, and in little ways every day, the vice is tightening. The, it's getting smaller. Our freedom is getting smaller. It's getting eroded, and our unity as a people is getting eroded. And it's not, it's, it's not by accident. It's by plan. Uh, the powers that shouldn't be don't want a free and open society. Uh, that doesn't fit their ends. Uh, they want a con- small, controlled society, and, uh, and they're going to have to do things to fix that. And what we saw in Ferguson – fed into that, what we saw with Eric Garner in New York, what we saw in Dallas uh, last week, that feeds directly into that end result. And uh, and I just don't see how we're going to turn it back. Um, before before we, we, we run out of time, I want to really, I want to kind of take us toward the, what I really see is the is the is one of the worst aspects of what went on in Dallas, and that's kind of how it came to an end. I'm sure you probably know what I'm referring to, Popeye. Yes, actually, when it happened, uh, you messaged me. But before we, we hop into that, I want to just throw this out there really quick about what you just said. Um, you said people are going to be begging for it. it. It just reminds me, and I've been saying this, it reminds me of a quote from Henry Kissinger at the Bilderberg meeting in Avion, France, back in 1992. And I quote, Today Americans would be outraged if UN troops entered Los Angeles to restore order. Tomorrow they will be grateful. This is especially true if they were told there was an outside threat from beyond, whether real or promulgated, that threatened our very existence. It is then that all peoples of the world will pledge with world leaders to deliver them from this evil. The one thing every man fears is the unknown. When presented with this scenario, individual rights will be willingly relinquished for the guarantee of their well-being granted to them by their world government. Now, let's take it down a notch and say not world government but we'll say tyrannical government here which is this is all part of that that world government agenda but we'll say our own home tyrannical government who by the way kissinger has his fingers all over the place isn't he one of obama's advisors oh that's right and you see his name popping up left and right but what did he say he said tomorrow they'll be grateful meaning the american people wanting the UN troops. Now replace the UN troops in that statement with 
federalized police. So I'm going to read this with the words federalized police instead, just, just the beginning line. Today, Americans would be outraged if federalized police entered Los Angeles to restore order. Tomorrow, they will be grateful. Any questions? So this was back in 1992. Just because he was referring to the UN troops, don't think that they wouldn't take that and work it down to the micro from the macro because it's part of the playbook. It's how they do things. So I, I just thought I would throw that in there, uh, that this is all being fomented. They know how to, they'll take a situation and they'll inflame it and then they surround it with emotional rhetoric to piss off a certain section of the population in order to continue this chess game that they're playing because they already know what the outcome is going to be and they're totally prepared for it, John. But that's what they want. Order, ab chao, order out of chaos. Well, their version of order. Anyway, so we were discussing, before we <clears throat> move on into other things, I want to stay focused on the Dallas shooting still for a bit. And you and I were discussing a conversation that we had. I had said that you texted me. Um, John and I are good friends. The l listeners that have been listening to the show for five years know this. And John shot me a text to my phone during this whole chaos, this mayhem of what happened with the Dallas shooting. He, it, you know, the Dallas shooting happened that night. And by that morning, John was texting me, you know, hoisting the bullshit flag. And he was like, there's just, there's some things here that really kind of stand out to me. And I'm not saying that the two of us are saying it didn't happen or anything like that. No, when you need, when you need chaos, you need to actually have a real body count and blood that solidifies it. So I totally believe it happened. I'm not going to say it didn't or anything like that, but what I know, and I know John can agree to this. They, the event, and may, maybe the guy, the guy could have been, you know, pushed or handled, and that you, you know, you'd find out later on in any sort of investigation. But uh, and there, you know, there could have been some sort of third party actor, you know, handling him or whatever. Or the guy genuinely could have been pissed off because of the situation. They understand that if you create the proper environment, things will happen. And that's what they're doing with the media. That's what the government officials are doing. That's what we were talking about earlier. So this whole situation happens, and John text messages me. And it, it, the text message, and I don't have my cell phone in front of me, but it went something to the effect of, I believe this is the first time ever that anyone's been killed by a robot, and I don't think it's legal. I don't think it's legal for any civilian police agency to do so. You're a seasoned homicide detective. You're a seasoned police officer. It's not like you're talking out your ass. It's not like you're you're talking out of place or out of any any area of you know ignorance to the the subject. You actually you're you're a seasoned police officer. You know exactly what you're talking about, and that that kind of blew my mind because I said I had said the same thing to Christina. The two of us were talking, and I was telling her about what happened, and she was she was blown away too. She even said to me, she said, "I I that's that's." You know, that's weird. Robots, like, she immediately saw what was going on. Like, robots killing people? Hmm. You know what I mean? And he, and then you texted me at the same time. So it was like we had this vortex of information going on, this uh, stream of consciousness. So thoughts. I mean, what what hit you when you first saw that? Besides what you, the background information that you did later on, like trying to figure out the scuttlebutt from you know, on the police end, what really happened. When you first heard that they used a robot to take this guy out, what was your first thought? My, f my first thought was, did I really hear just what I heard? Um, I was, like everyone else, you know, when we heard there was a conclusion to it, the logical qu next question is how. And, uh, you know, I, I, I was never a, a you know, a, a negotiator with a hostage situation or a barricaded suspect situation. But, you know, you expect barricaded suspect situations, hostage situations, they can go on for days at some point. So when I woke up the morning after and found out it was over, I'm like, well, how? And uh, and so I turned, I tuned in to the, to the news conference by the police chief of Dallas, uh, Chief Brown, and he gives he's he opens his statement and gives the normal the normal stuff you hear when they're giving background on these kind of things and then very nonchalantly he drops that they sent in the robot with a device and it blew up and neutralized the suspect 
And he kept going on and describing the situation after that. And I turned to my wife and I said, did he just say they took something in and blew him up? And and I immediately went to the web and started trying to search for transcripts, and I couldn't find anything in a long time. So the fact that I didn't see things calling attention to it made me think, well, maybe I heard it wrong. And so I did some more digging, and I listened to some radio shows, and I'm trying to think, did I hear what I thought I heard? And it probably took me about two hours before I finally settled on the fact that, yes, the police chief said they drove a robot in there with an explosive device and blew the guy up. And I thought, my God, that's never happened before. Um, Never in the history of the police have we, to my knowledge, ever blown anybody up, let alone sent a robot in to blow somebody up. And uh, my next question was, is that even legal? I mean, where would the police even get high-grade explosives um, with timer devices? Now, I know that that bomb squads and squads in major cities, they train with stuff like that. They have the knowledge of stuff like that. But to actually take that and deploy it, who did they have to get permission from to be able to do that? Because it's never done. And uh, in, I've discussed this with a, with a police officer friend of mine who actually is also a member of Oath Keepers. So you're not talking you know, a jackbooted thug. Uh, you're talking a guy who understands the Constitution. And at first, at first blush, he didn't, have, he didn't have a problem with it. But we discussed it more. And in the end, it's like, how is this due process? Now, I don't want people to think for a second, wait a second, this guy just killed five cops. Aren't you pissed off? Well, hell yeah, I'm pissed off. And did the guy need killing? Yeah, he did. Um, But the problem I have is we've never before proactively driven an explosive device into a situation and just summarily blew somebody up. And, And when I say summarily, we basically summarily executed this guy, which... He needed to kill him, but do we really want to set the precedent in our nation that summary execution, no judge, no jury, no due process? Do we really want to kind of do we really want to sanction that as being acceptable? And it just blew me away the way that that was that was spoken by that police chief nonchalantly, like it happens every day, and uh, and it's never happened before. And so I, I have serious problems. Um, with the way it was, the, with the way it happened, the end result, I'm not really upset about. Um, the reality is, my expectation of what should have happened was there was no hurry to end the situation. Really, um, you have a madman who's cornered. He says he's got IEDs everywhere, but we haven't seen any IEDs go off. So you've got him cornered. What's the hurry to end the situation? You have it under control. You have him in a location where he can't get away. What's the hurry? And wouldn't you be able to gather a lot more information potentially if you try to figure out a peaceful resolution, even if it takes a day? Eventually the guy's going to give up somehow or he's going to kill himself. One of the two things. But what was the reasoning for we have to end it now? And if you have to end it now, why do you send in a robot with an explosive and blow somebody up? who, while it's kind of distasteful and hard to swallow, while he still has his rights as, as an American, and he still has due process, we, didn't, we don't get to crumple up the Constitution for expediency or, or uh, you know, because we think we, we, we might be facing something else, so we're going to crumple up the Constitution right now. And how far of a leap is it? Okay, think about it for a second. How far of, of a leap is it from driving a robot in to a barricaded suspect who's armed and blowing him up. How far is it from that to an armed drone shooting a missile at somebody who's barricaded or or closed in somewhere to solve this emerging problem? Um, and I'm and I'm not sure that that most America looks to the logical conclusions drawn by what's went on. And and so to me that's. One of them, other than obviously five police officers being killed and the further uh, erosion of the of the police and the community's relationship, to me that's the most dangerous aspect of what occurred in the aftermath of Dallas, is that you saw for the first time a a, a still a legal suspect um, summarily executed. Um, if they would have sent in a SWAT team to confront him at the very last second, he could have thrown his hands up and said, "I give up. I give up." Take me to trial. I want my lawyer. 
But when you drive a robot in there and you just push the button and it blows up, there's no possibility for a uh, for due process, and that that gives me great great trouble. And uh, and I'm telling you, you're going to see it again, um, probably sooner than later. I, if if it went if it was a a year before the next next time somebody was blown up by a robot an explosive device, I would be really shocked. I would expect it to happen in the next two or three months. Well, they're just uh, recently discussing arming drones and stuff too for police, and then this happens. And I'm not saying that they did this to, to push that narrative, but what they'll do is they'll take advantage. This this precedent that's been set will be taken advantage of and used. And I wholeheartedly agree with you. I mean, this is really a, a scary turn that we've taken. We've now used a, a bomb robot, a robot, to kill a human being. And people are going to say, who cares? The guy was a scumbag. He killed people. Okay. Put all that aside for a second. Understand that what happens when they run out of bad guys like that? And now you're the bad guy because you didn't pay your fine for mowing your lawn. And they have an automated drone that's the size of a hummingbird, which, by the way, they're working on. It comes in and it shoots some sort of whatever at you and kills you because they viewed you as, you know, you're a problem or whatever. I mean, it, oh, I know. That's crazy. That's the slippery slope argument, Popeye. But no, actually, that's the logical conclusion because if you do the research, they've already been working since like 2011, 2012 on swarm technology where they want to fly over a city and dump out 50, 60, 70, 80,000 little drones that look like insects. And they're all independent, but they all work together. Uh, think about the technology that we have right now. Think about the capabilities that we complain about already with warfare. We're headed to being treated like they treat the people in Afghanistan and Iraq with drone strikes. Oh, no, Popeye, what, you're crazy. Oh, but if you actually go and listen to some of the shows I've done about the Iraq war, for example, where I played the audio of these guys that they call themselves, they were from the Iraq Mujahideen or whatever, and they were the media division, and I've played the, the audio from it, and I've titled it, Just Who Were We Fighting in Iraq?, and the guy says in it very prophetically, it, this was made in like 2005, and he says, this police state that you've brought to Iraq will be brought back to you. Your country will bring it back upon you. And they're right. A lot of the weapons of war that were tested in Iraq are now on the streets with the police. The things we were t John and I were talking about earlier, and them using LRADs and all this other stuff for crowd control. And, hmm, where was all of that tested? Well, in the Middle East. So... Then you in Afghanistan, and then you now you look at Afghanistan, right? It's the country's longest ongoing war, except the Vietnam War, which actually went on longer than most people realize. It started back at World War Two, oh, and the war on drugs, which is another retarded war, but that's a whole separate side issue. <laughs> so, uh, I, I could I could go off onto all of those uh, two separate you know two separate entire shows. So. You see these weapons of war being tested in foreign countries first, but now you're they're being the idea of it is being brought back home, and I don't think it's a far stretch, like you said, to go from bomb robot with C four, I think is what they used, and so bomb robot with C four in its hand to drone shooting a missile and doing a drone strike. Well, you know the guy was a threat, and we didn't want officers to be killed because that's what they said they used the robot for. They said they were afraid that he was going to storm the officers. He was already wounded and bleeding out because they had already gone into it with him. He was shot by the one cop in the that he, he took out by the pillar. And then they followed his blood trail into the garage and that's where they cornered him. And then they got into it. This is according to the official story. Then they got into a gunfight with him, I guess, in the garage and he was wounded again. So the guy's wounded. He's been hit at least twice. He's bleeding. He was writing in his own blood, right? So And they said he was singing, he didn't care about dying. So if he charges the officers, I mean, you have a SWAT team. Aren't they all, don't they all have their rifles trained on where he's going to come, the corner he's going to come around, right? He steps around a corner, he's dead anyway. You, I mean, none of them have laser sights, right? Like, in the movies, when you see somebody come out and all, there's like 800 lasers pointed at them, where are those guys? Isn't that why you have police that have training, right? With rifles, and you have a SWAT team? So you have like, let's say... 10 or 12 guys 
and everybody, you know, even if you had seven guys, you have seven, eight rifles pointed at this guy. I know he's, let, let's say we, I buy the official story and that there was nobody else involved, even though they arrested other people, but we haven't heard about those people anymore. I know. I, I know. I know. Don't don't worry about mm. it. Went, went from four people to one shooter. But let's, you know, I mean, you know, there's, there's nothing shady about that. But let's say you buy the official story that this guy's the... The, the the lone shooter. Well, what are you worried about? If he, there's like seven or at least seven eight of you, you're all highly trained individuals. He comes, he sticks his head around the corner. You blow it off. Why not try to find out if the guy had IEDs? Why wouldn't you try to find out where they're they're located? I mean, I, I understand that you want to take the guy out, especially he just killed five police officers, wounded uh, what was it like another six or seven, uh, hit a couple civilians. I I, I understand. The emotional reaction and the desire, the overwhelming desire for revenge and to go whoop some ass. Believe me, I understand it. But as like the chief of police who has the call to say what's going to happen, why why would you say yes and then the robot kill the guy? I mean, why? I mean, wh- let the guy come around the corner again. You guys are going to take him out. You know, I mean, you could have the robot there, I guess, and ready to go that if he did come around a corner, then you blow it. You take his ass out. But at least, I don't know, it just, it it sounds almost to a degree a, a little shady. And I don't know for what, I mean, you could say, well, they were trying to cover things up. And of course, they had to kill the only gunman. And it is kind of convenient that it, it's a lone gunman. And the guy died, John, because, you know, as an investigator... I know you know that now it's their word versus a dead man's. And is there anything this guy maybe would have said? Did he have a handler? I mean, who were those other three people? There's a lot of questions that are left unanswered uh, and that will never be answered because he's not around to answer them. So unless you can find solid evidence, it's speculation to a degree. So there's there's that. But I just think... I, I don't know. I, I I'm trying to figure out. I I don't want to say why they they did what they did. I mean, they're saying they did it to protect their officers. So at, at the very least, I know they do have that attitude of they have to whatever it takes to get home at the end of the shift. And, and that's not good when it comes to like the idea of community policing, like you were saying, real community policing. Uh, it, it's it, that attitude is you know you're going to do whatever you have to do. To, to hurt somebody or to do whatever you got to do to cover your own ass to get home at the end of the shift. And that, uh, uh, amongst other things, is part of the reason why you have this, this issue with the police. I think the whole idea that they're their own class of individuals and that they're above the law uh, and that they don't... Back in the day, for years and years and years, there was no... Uh, you know, it's only become popular in the past year or so for police to be held accountable for their actions to a large degree. And you know what I'm talking about because we did shows about this. And we even said, both of us, said that if more police were held accountable for their actions when they're wrong and there was more interaction with the public as a whole, that it would actually de-escalate this. And that's like just simple classic de-escalation tactics that aren't you already taught as a police officer so it's it, it, it you have to look at the training and say why is the training changed well again going back to that whole police state thing that we were talking about earlier but hey don't look at that hate each other because you're black and you're white which is stupid because all that is is pigment color and there might be a few cultural differences here and there but we're all humans you know i if i was bleeding in a hospital and i needed blood and the person next to me had the same blood type I did, I wouldn't care if they were Asian. I wouldn't care if they were Jewish. I wouldn't care if they were Christian. I wouldn't care if they were straight, gay. I wouldn't care if they were male, female. I wouldn't care if they were black, white, red, purple with pink polka dots. As long as the blood wasn't tainted in any way, shape, or form, it was clean, there was, you know, whatever, and the person, you know, I, it, and it was going to save my ass... No, I really don't care about the petty divisions. I don't care. I mean, at at the end of the day, we all run the same way. We're like cars, ladies and gentlemen. Or whatever type of automated vehicle you want to envision. I like to use a car as an example. 
right? We're all cars. Our bodies are all the same. We all operate the same. On the outside, we, have, we might look different. We might have different curves. We might have different paint jobs. We might have different accessories. But the basic idea of how the car functions is pretty much the same. And that's how we are as humans. Yet we can't seem to get that through our thick skulls because we've been manipulated. And every time we start to get that through and we start to understand that, that's when you see things being manipulated in the media and the narrative being changed, like around the time Ferguson happened. Now, I'm not saying Ferguson happened to throw everybody off. No, that was a real event. The coverage, the spin, the propaganda, and the things that were being said at the time were, that's where the manipulation comes in. That's where the stoking of the fires comes in. That's where the change in the narrative comes in. And since then, it's been focused on that narrative and nothing else. I mean, even the news media, again, the mainstream media was asking why we have a militarized police. And then suddenly it was about black versus white. And now after Dallas, here's the other thing that I see coming out of this. Because I heard the mayor of Dallas mention this in the press conference, like that, the you know the day after. And the police chief, I actually, I'll give him credit. He wanted to expand on the mayor's remarks, but the mayor came on and he was like, "Yeah, you know, people say, what well, do cops really need? You know, all that gear and all that stuff and all those, you know, armored vehicles. Well, now you see why. And I'm going to double down on my efforts to make sure more police have more equipment and thing. And I'm like, oh wow. So there you go. You have the mayor admitting they're going to use this as a way to push the police state and the militarization." of the local police forces, which is eventually leading to what I am going to say, and everybody else has been calling this out for a while now, the federalization of police. And John, you and I have been saying this for a very, 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 very long time. That's the goal, and that's what they're doing. They need to piss off the general public enough where the general public says, yeah, you know what, you need to come in here and do something about this. And you already hear that to a large degree. You hear people saying the government should come in and fix it. Newsflash, the government doesn't fix anything, okay? Anything that they put their hands on usually turns to shit and a bigger mess. Just look at anything they've ever put their hands on, ever. Maybe people should start to wonder. It's not really government. Government's just a tool. But maybe, maybe people should start to wonder. The average Joe maybe doesn't believe there's so many actual nefarious things going on. Ask yourself... That why, since Obama, the first black president, came into office, race relations in this country have gotten extremely horrible. They've actually gotten exponentially worse. Why? Why is there this constant push? Again, the divide and conquer tactics. With the back of our t-shirts and the back of our business cards, we have a guy, character we call Uncle Jack. And he's got a Democrat puppet and a Republican puppet on each hand. And they have like mesmerizing eyes. And the motto underneath was, I want like the old Uncle Sam thing, I want you. And then underneath it, it said, to fight and argue amongst each other while I retain complete control. And that's exactly what's going on. Everybody's fighting amongst themselves over the most stupid things, whether it's race, whether it's politics, whether it's sexual orientation, doesn't matter. And everybody's arguing over it. And while everybody's arguing over these non-issues that we were, shouldn't we be passed already in 2016, right? Again, shouldn't we be past all this? I thought we were already working past this. Why are we suddenly going backwards? But no one's paying attention to that. They're all just vitriolically yelling at one another, but no one's looking at who's actually driving this in reverse. It's being done on purpose. We're being socially engineered to accept, A, a a bigger police state, but B, they need to literally change the way we think about each other. We, We have to... We have to be willing to accept the subjugation of our fellow human beings, of our own loved ones, because maybe, maybe they don't agree. You know, maybe we buy into one thing and they buy into another thing. And oh my God, we're we're fighting, and I hate this person. I'm willing to let this happen to them, my own loved one, because hey, I don't care about them anymore because of their belief. We're we're divided. I no longer love my parents or my brother or my sister. I mean, the art, the, the level of division in this country is sh- ripping families apart at this point. To a lot, I've seen people like not talk to their wives or their husbands because of this. You know, I've seen spouses, brothers, sisters fighting over over what, or, or, you know, whether it's politics, 
whether it's sexual orient, someone else's sexual orientation, not even their own. You know what I mean? I mean, this this is being done for a reason. It's it's literally manipulation of society 101. And they're doing it like pros. They're doing it like the puppet masters they are. Because they, they, they have an end game and they're headed for it. Now, sometimes we might create a bump in the road, but then they're smart enough to try to figure out a way around it. It's our responsibility to be able to, A, recognize the problem, B, figure out how to not let them get around it, and if they do, how do we have to see, be smart enough to foresee that problem and figure out a way to deal with that too and b- be vigilant and smart enough that if we can't foresee a problem and we have to react to the problem, then at least we can react accordingly. We we need to try to stay left of bang more often than not. It's a great book. I'm going to be getting the author on. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just go look up the book, Left of Bang. Anyway, there's a lot of stuff that you could learn with combat profiling. Anyway, so, John, I know uh, we're going to be running out of time, and I want to get into, um, I want to get your final thoughts on the whole Dallas thing, the police state, everything we just talked about right now. But I also want to get your thoughts on the death of Justice Scalia. So before we move on to Scalia, what are your final thoughts about Dallas, the division in this country, community policing, what I just said, police state, everything? Go. Number one, everybody has to embrace the idea of supporting your local police with an emphasis on that word being local. Um the federal government has been weaseling its way into the the uh, management of police departments for 50 years, 60 years, and it started with all the block block grants they would give police departments for training and for equipment and for overtime programs and drug enforcement and seatbelt laws and everything else. It, they all tied it to purse strings. That's how it kind of it started. And slowly they weaseled their way to where, you know, the the next step was the International Association of Chiefs of Police. They they write model policies for all these departments, and a city or municipality or a county, their insurance rate is based upon partially how well their policies conform with those of the model policies written by the IACP. Police departments have been have been harmonizing their training, harmonizing their policies over the last twenty or thirty years. And in essence, we're working our way toward a federal police. And if you think I'm over-exaggerating, um, just in the last 72 hours, President Obama came out and, and said that there's calls for formalizing and requiring police departments to have a federal training standard. Um, and they're going to tie it to the funds. And that's in the funds by the toys, by the equipment. And so the federal government's going to be running the training and running the equipping of the police departments. Well, you know what? If you run the training and you run the policies and you run the equipping, what do you basically have? You have a unified force. Um, you're going to need to, you need to support your local police. You need to demand your police stay local and stay responsible to whatever the community standards are in your community. And you need to demand and elect people and push people to police you the way that you, the public, you, the society, you, the community – want to be policed, um, that's going to be the first linchpin. The takeaways from Dallas are we're in for a very rocky, rocky summertime. Um, You're going to see problems at both political conventions. I estimate you'll probably see one, maybe several armed confrontations that are going to be similar to the Dallas situation. Um, Don't be fooled. Uh, by the powers it shouldn't be. Keep your police control local. Remember all the commonalities we share with each other, not the differences. It's a difference in pigmentation of your skin, you know, a few small cultural differences. The rest, we're all the same. You have the same rights as citizens of this country. You bleed the same blood. You breathe the same air. You buy the same crap at Walmart. Um, for those who are In the inner cities, remember, yes, there are some racist police officers, but they are vastly outnumbered by men and women 
who truly care about the safety of your community. And we need to, to expand on the ones that are, that are uh, truly the peace officers of the, of, the, of the police department and marginalize those that see themselves as overseers and as, contr- as puppet masters, as controllers. We need to take back control of our police departments. And we need to, to, to force them to police us the way that we deem necessary, we deem correct, because that's your right. We are, we are a society governed by the people. And if, you're, if you don't have the police department you want, well, then elect the people that will do it. And when they don't do it, you kick their asses out and you elect the other people that say they're going to do it. Um, you can't let them further degrade our society. And that's what's happening. They're put, pushing us in corners away from each other. And then they're going to take control of the middle, and they're going to control the battle space. And if you don't think this is a battle, you're deluding yourself. This is absolutely a battle. It's a battle between control and between freedom. And uh, and I encourage everyone to embrace freedom and and to look at the cops who are doing a good job in your society and hold them up and praise them and encourage them to become the leaders. Um, we're not going to win this by further dividing and further eroding the relationship between the police and the public. And leading to other, you know, mass shootings and situations, and uh, and I fear for our country. I tremble. I tremble for our nation right now. I'm going to read you a quote from Barack Obama. We cannot continue to rely only on our military in order to achieve the national security objectives that we've set. We've got to have a civilian national security force that's just as powerful, just as strong. Just as well funded. Sorry, I was trying to put his emphasis on it because I can actually hear his voice. I remember that quote. We cannot continue to rely only on our military in order to achieve the national security objectives that we've set. We've got to have a civilian national security force that's just as powerful, just as strong, just as well funded. A federalized police force would fit that, wouldn't it? militarized, yep. federalized police force. And, and John, let's just be honest. I mean, if you have a federalized police force, that's pretty much the standing army that the Founding Fathers were warning about, I do believe. Absolutely. Mm, that's pretty dangerous to our freedom, is it not? Well, not that we have real freedom anymore anyway, but that's a whole side issue. You get my point, though. We're screwed. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, my God. No, you know, sometimes I just want to pick my computer monitor up off the desk, hurl it across the room and walk out, hop in my rocket ship, and take the cats, the dog, Christina myself and head to the dark side of the moon for real uh it's uh, i joke about it on air you know quite often for real it's just really sometimes i just want to bash my head into a wall it gets frustrating but we carry on because that's what we do so in that vein i want to carry on into the conversation of justice scalia because i know i only got you for a short more period of time so when scalia died couple months back when justice supreme court justice anton scalia died um we had a conversation via text uh, about the entire situation and uh you know to quote hamlet something's rotten in the town of denmark and i just felt right away that the information that had come out about the situation was very shady And you seem to have the same opinion of the situation, but you had a much better understanding and knowledge because you're there in Texas. So, with that in mind, feel free to expand on your thoughts about the death of Justice Scalia and if you think he was taken out, and if he was, why? Whew, okay, um... In the state of Texas, when any death occurs, any death, crackhead, police officer, city councilman, mayor, governor, Supreme Court justice, 
no body is supposed to touch that body until it's released by a medical examiner. And generally speaking, the medical examiner, especially in rural counties, makes the scene to make sure that the everything jives. And then they release the body, and the body can be transported to, you know, a, a funeral home and go on about their business, and they'll sign the death certificate. My issues with Scalia are he was found in his bedroom. Um, some reports had a pillow over his head. Um, some reports just said his head was obscured. Um, from what I understand, the medical examiner, and I can't remember her name off the top of my head, um, she phoned in and talked to somebody on the phone and released the body over the phone. Never having seen the situation, been able to look at the evidence, talk to the witnesses, nothing. His body was then transported, and I believe he was cremated a short time later. Problem. Nobody on the outside ever saw that body. Nobody knew the situation surrounding his death. Nobody from the outside interviewed witnesses. The medical examiner didn't do her job. And that would have been for anybody. We're not talking Supreme Court justice. Um, in this situation, the only acceptable path uh, would have been when they find the body, they should have immediately secured the scene and contacted the Texas Rangers because it was a rural area. The Texas Rangers would have come down and conducted an investigation, interviewed witnesses, um, taken photographs, measurements. And then and only then would, this, would the medical examiner come in, do their own separate investigation, release the body, and the body would have been released for processing. Um, I, I have serious problems. In fact, this kind of, in ways, to me, harkens back to the fiasco with JFK's body after he died at Parkland Hospital in Dallas. There was a well-known altercation between Texas law enforcement and Secret Service, where Texas law enforcement told the Secret Service, this body is not going anywhere because he died in the state of Texas, and we have laws that govern how that body should be handled. The Secret Service threatened an armed confrontation to force them to release his body without a, a medical inquest. So with Scalia, you have potentially a spoiled scene. You have a medical examiner who released the body without ever viewing the situation, viewing the evidence, or viewing the body. And you have the fact that it's a Supreme Court justice. I don't know whether he was murdered or not. Nobody will ever know. When you look at what's going on today... Could he have been murdered? Absolutely, he could have been murdered. But we'll never know. But what I can say is, without a doubt, the handling of that dead body, that dead man scene, was handled incorrectly from beginning to end. And because of the intentional or accidental malfeasance on the part of law enforcement and uh, the medical examiner, uh, or the county judge, or constable, whoever, not constable, but... Uh, the local magistrate, however they handled, however they mishandled it, we will never know the truth of it. But I find it odd. Uh, uh, the timing is very odd, and the situation would have dictated a full investigation, even if they were a hundred percent sure that he died of a heart attack or whatever in his sleep. The situation dictated a full investigation, and it didn't happen, and so. It's reasonable to say, was it bungled by an accident or was it bungled on purpose? And uh, we'll just never know. And uh, there's I, – I wish there would have been more thorough, even more than we had investigation because honestly it was such a shoddy investigation. We can't even – we can't even dream up conspiracy theories on it because the investigation was so bad. At least with other conspiracies, normally we have some facts to go on. But this one was handled so terribly from beginning to end, the facts will never be known. And uh, Scalia could have very well been murdered in that room, and, uh, and it was covered up. But we'll never know. What do you think, Popeye? 
Well, there's a lot of shady things with his death. I mean, they said that they found him with a pillow over his head. And then a couple of days later, the guy was like, no, let me clarify. I mean, it was above his head on the bed. Really? Hmm. Really? You said it was over his head. You didn't say above. You didn't say sitting on the bed above it. You said over his head. Um, the whole autopsy thing, just the way the whole body was handled, uh, the way that the, they, the coroner did it over the phone, like not even in person, relying solely on what the officers at the scene and the whatever agents were at the scene, uh, whatever information that they were able to get from them. That doesn't sound, I mean, I, I know it can be done, but it just doesn't sound right in the case of a Supreme Court justice. And there's also the possibility that the bungling of the investigation itself was done on purpose to hide the evidence. Like you said, it was done so bad that there's not even evidence for people to debate over. Doesn't that sound odd? Just saying. It sounds a little odd for an investigation, especially of this depth. So perhaps the entire bungling of the situation was done on purpose so that facts will never be found. There can't be any conspiracy theories or questions because it's never going to be found. Let me also say that the government structure in South Texas is notoriously corrupt. Uh, Notorious. Um, Pretty much every election cycle you have election irregularities that, that lead to you know, investigations and sometimes people being fired or thrown in prison. I mean, just look it up. Google search it. South Texas corruption. And uh, you'll have probably thousands of hits uh, because their governments are corrupt. And if you want to, for argument's sake, take somebody out, where better to do it than where you know the government is corrupt and people can be paid off and look the other way? Um, it was the perfect setting. It was rural. It was private and rural, and it wouldn't be a large or or uh, irreasonable leap to say that somebody was paid off to look the other way and to make sure that it wasn't handled right. I mean, my understanding was he didn't even have a full autopsy. Um, Standard in Texas is unless you're actively under the care of your doctor for what could be considered a life-threatening illness – a full autopsy always takes place. But in Scalia's situation, his family said they didn't want a full autopsy for whatever reason, and they said okay. Had the investigation been handled correctly from the beginning, it wouldn't be a red flag that a full autopsy wasn't done. But the fact it was bungled from the very beginning, to add that cherry on top, that we're not even going to do a full autopsy on Scalia, is absolutely insane. We don't know if he was drugged. We don't know if he died of asphyxia. We don't know if there were uh, uh, petechia in his retinas, which would show that that he was smothered. We don't know because it was bungled from the very beginning. And then nobody dared put a stop to it somewhere in the middle and say, wait a second. This is a sitting Supreme Court justice. There is some decorum. There is some procedure that needs to be followed. Uh, for anyone's death, but more especially someone in a powerful position as a Supreme Court justice. Well, again, something's rotten in the town of Denmark. Uh, You know, I expect at the very least that because it was a Supreme Court justice, and I know the family can say, no, we don't want one, but as an investigator myself, right, I, I, I was a private investigator, you know this. So let's say I was a federal investigator, right? or local law enforcement official. I was called to the scene, and I, I get there. And I it, it, Obviously, he was a Supreme Court justice, so the U.S. Marshals are going to be there. So they're going to show up eventually. He's he. They're supposed to have protection. Even if he didn't want protection, the, there's going to be one, you know, I would assume relatively close to him or within a half hour to an hour of where he is. I, I just can't see the U.S. Marshals... You know, saying, okay, sir, and then going back to their office and not actually guarding the guy. Even though, You know what I mean? Like, just saying, yes, sir, you know, we, we'll, we'll leave you alone, and then guarding him from a distance if they had to. It's still their job. And uh, Anyway, I digress. So if I'm a U.S. Marshal, if I'm going to look at this, and I, I stumble upon this Supreme Court justice who, is, who has died, 
I'm not going to just say, ah, natural causes, because you really can't tell what he died of unless you have an autopsy. So they have the ability to be like, okay, we need to investigate this properly. He needs to have an autopsy done. Then the family would have to go to the lead investigator and say, does there really need to be an autopsy done? Like they'd have to go out of their way to try to get it stopped. Whereas it was set up so it was more so the family's decision. And they're like, no, we don't want one, which in itself is weird. Now, I understand that the the grieving process. Trust me, I'm not picking on anybody for how they grieve. I've done shows about that. Okay, I know very, very, very intimately about that. But if my loved one died in a rural area at some secret society get-together, which... That's what it was. Some little conservative secret society get together. Whatever the reason they're out there for. He, it, it's this little secretive group. He's out there at this get together in a secluded area. He's a Supreme Court justice who's been known to be a defender of things like the Second Amendment and other freedoms. And I'm not saying he's, you know, hark, uh, oh my God, here comes the hero, Scalia. But I'm saying he, he, he's known to have this stance and then suddenly he dies a mysterious death and the circumstances are mysterious and like every standard operating procedure was violated one after another after another after another but violated it blatantly but in a way that you could tell it's a well greased corruption machine like they've handled other things like this before that this wasn't their first rodeo the way this whole thing was handled. And I just thought it was really shady that a Supreme Court justice, there was just like, oh, he died, end of story, bye. And nobody was like, wow, that's kind of weird, though, the whole way he died. I mean, if that were anybody else, there would have been a, a much deeper investigation. So I thought it was odd that because it was a Supreme Court justice that it wasn't done. I mean, that alone to me was probably the the biggest red flag and then the family's reaction and people could say well you know the family Popeye yeah they could easily have gotten to the family and said by the way we did this to him or make a comment implying that they did something to him and then implying that if you don't do what you're told or you don't listen or don't you just in this case don't ask for an autopsy if you ask for the autopsy and you push it you know I'd hate to see something bad happen to Oh, like your grandkids or your daughter or your, your, your son or whatever. If I, I don't remember if he had kids or not. But if they had kids, then that's how they do it. Or, you know, maybe she has a sister who has kids and, they, and they've got pictures of those kids on their way to school. That's the way. I mean, if they're going to kill a Supreme Court justice, these people, that's the level they do things. They don't just like half-ass things. They cover every aspect. That's, that's really the unfortunate level of that kind of thing that happens. So... That being said, those were my big red flags. Uh, And to me, seeing uh, just the way the whole thing was handled was like, what? what? If this were anybody else, they would have done a better job than that. I'm just kind of surprised that they didn't, being that he was a Supreme Court justice, that it wasn't gone beyond. You know what I mean? Like you would expect that they would follow every rule, dot every I, cross every T, and it was just like, eh, 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 the whole, the whole way through. And like you said, it, it kind of brings up a, a lot of things from the Kennedy assassination that have to deal with corruption and the way that there was a lot of corruption uh, surrounding not only uh, the assassination of the president himself, but the deaths of other people, like witnesses and stuff, too. And it just it goes to show you that that level of, like, boss hog corruption is still there to this very day in 2016. Yes, it is. And, and I want to be real clear about something. It was not the family's call initially. That justice of the peace would have had to have waived jurisdiction on the autopsy before the family would have even gotten a choice. So the first level was just the piece saying, I'm going to phone this one in, and then saying, given the testimony that was widely reported, I'm not going to order an autopsy. And then it falls to the family to decide. So it was, it was bungled from beginning to end. It was allowed to be an a, a incompetent investigation 
from the top to the bottom. And the ball was dropped at the local level, state level, the county level, the federal level. It was dropped all the way. And that would have been for anybody. But for a sitting Supreme Court justice who was a controversial Supreme Court justice, there was just no – there's no uh, there's no looking the other way. There something was wrong, and uh, and I'm not one to believe in coincidences. So this stuff doesn't happen in a vacuum, and uh, we'll never know. But yeah, this in some ways this is in some ways worse than the Kennedy. The body handling was somewhat worse than the Kennedy assassination situation um, because they had the kennedy assassination it was it was pandemonium it was shock it was horror it was national disaster national tragedy this was a guy dying at a secluded private club in the middle of nowhere south texas there was no hurry to do anything there was no reason to get in a hurry and yet it was handled in a very hurried fashion and bungled completely and uh he could have been murdered. Someone may have gotten away with murder of a Supreme Court justice. We'll never know. You know, just further weakens whatever faith somebody somewhere may have in the in the system. It just further weakens that uh that f- whatever faith they may have. If they can murder a Supreme Court justice, they can murder anybody. Yeah, well, they blew the president's head off in Dealey Plaza fifty years ago and didn't get in trouble for it, so. Yep. There's that. But yeah, there's there's a lot of shadiness that, that went on with that case. So I wanted to get your take on it. And I know you had said that there was a lot, a lot of uh, boss hog corruption uh, there in Texas. A lot of good old boy type stuff behind the scenes. And I, I, I could see that you'd have him taken out at a spot that was secluded. And you'd have him taken out. A in spot an, that's controlled. Yeah, in an area that is controlled heavily by the locals who are in your pocket. It's the same way they killed Kennedy. It's the exact same way they killed Jack. They did him in Dallas because they knew Lyndon had Texas, and Lyndon controlled a lot of the things down there and had a lot of sway at the time, so they could get away with a lot of things. And uh, Alan Dulles. Was, oh, uh... Dulles too. <laughs> well, he got he got fired. I, you know, he gets fired by Kennedy over the whole Bay of Pigs invasion, and and then. Um, He's put in charge of the investigation. Cabell was the mayor of Dallas, and his brother was working f- with the CIA and the Bay of Pigs, and you know, he was in the military. He was a general. He got fired, and he was quite pissed off. And then his brother just happens to be the mayor of Dallas, and the parade route was changed at the last minute with the Secret Service and the mayor's office. So that would mean you needed to have the mayor of Dallas in on it and the head of the Secret Service. Oh, well, that's doable. I mean, there were a lot of people that were in on it. But anyway, I digress. So there's that <laughs> boss hog, you know, type scumbaggery. You have the, the mayor of Dallas, whose brother was fired by Kennedy, pissed off. Good old boy makes sure he's got, you know, the right people in place. Not that they did the assassination, but he would at least have the right people in place to help facilitate whatever was needed. And that's how it's done. Well, and you, then you put your, your wild conspiracy cap on, and he was there with some re- religious secret society uh, meeting at this private club, and there's been questions surrounding who paid for the private jet that took him down there, and he declined uh, federal protection on this trip, and it's just uh, – you all roll it together, and it just stinks. It stinks horribly. And, uh, I wonder how they. Con- I wonder how they convinced him to get him over there with no protection. Like he had to have been smart enough to to, to realize that he was under some sort of threat. So I mean, I wonder how long how long they planned it. I mean, he they had to lure him in there with, and, and keep him comfortable for in order for him to because they said he turned away his own security detail. He was like, "Nah, I don't want protection." That's why I said before, you'd think that some a, a U.S. Marshal would still uh, even protect at a distance, so to speak, you know, protect well, them it, without them it, knowing. And you, and you wrap it all up, and yet there's no investigation. And that's essentially what happened. There was no investigation of this death of a Supreme Court justice under suspicious circumstances. No investigation. No detail to protect him in a secluded area. 
dies suspiciously, no investigation, body is, doesn't have an autopsy. Can you can can you write a cheesy, you know, conspiracy novel on on a on a more crappy plot? It wouldn't sell any books because it's a crappy plot. But in this situation, it's what really happened, and uh, and we'll never know. Well, all, all I'm gonna say is it's extremely shady that uh, it went down the way it went down. It's extremely, extremely shady that he died the way he died. Like you said, out in the middle of nowhere. No no investigation. You would think that they would want to investigate the death of a Supreme Court justice, but, pff, you know, John, stop being a conspiracy theorist. In <laughs> fact, you know, the way you speak, detective, is almost like you were a homicide detective or something and you're trying to come from a place of logic you know like you're actually oh wait a minute yeah that's right ladies and gentlemen John's not you you can try to use that pejorative label he's a conspiracy theorist actually no he's a seasoned homicide detective hello hello we're talking about the murder or excuse me the supposed murder but the death of a supreme court justice and yet, you have a retired, seasoned homicide detective telling you, yeah, something doesn't smell right. They should have done at least the most basic of investigations, and they didn't. It was like, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. Send him off, let him be buried, let make the family happy. You know, he, he served with dignity. We need to treat him with dignity. Um, I'm pretty sure that if he died under suspicious circumstances, he would want his death investigated. He was, after all, a Supreme Court justice. And wasn't he working for the law? And isn't the law to have his death investigated? It, uh, I'm, I'm just, you know, I, it's this cycle I see of bullshit. Anyway, yeah, <laughs> I, I don't, I, I honestly don't buy any of it. I think it, the whole thing stinks to high hell. And to know that, a again, a seasoned homicide detective is going, um, <clears throat> can I raise my hand here for a second and point out a few problems with this whole thing? <laughs> you know, it, it it makes me feel good to know that my bullshit detector is not broken and that the meter going, you know, pinning itself when I heard that the official version of events in regards to Scalia's death, um, I'm, I'm glad that the detector is still working because... I, uh, you know, I saw that and I was like, wait, what? Wait, wait, what? No. No, 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 no. No. So, uh, I'm good to know that I'm not the only one, especially, like I said, a, 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 seen, a seasoned investigator such as yourself, John. Uh, you've done real investigations of, of deaths before and crimes and stuff, so I don't, you know, you know what to look for better than anyone because you actually have done this. That That was your profession and you're saying that this... You know, you're hoisting the flag that screams, wait a minute, there's a problem here. So you're hoisting the BS flag on this. Uh, just saying, you know, to the average listener who might think that, oh, Scalia just died and his family, whatever, blah, 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 there's no conspiracy. Remember, it conspiracy, the definition is actually a legal charge, and it's two or more people getting together to do something bad, i.e. a plot. So if you had two or more people conspiring which you would need to conspiring to take out a supreme court justice and then covering it up so you can always tell you don't want to believe the initial act was a murder that's fine put it in break it down into two parts i say this all the time it's 9-11 the jfk assassination anything if you don't want to believe the crime was perpetrated on purpose or a murder or a false flag terror event in the case of 9-11 break down break it down into two pieces the event and the aftermath of the event and in the aftermath, you always have to look at the investigation. And when you look at the investigation and it's whitewashed and covered up and people lie and people die, well, just saying. Right? You hit the nail on the head. Just just saying. You know? It's like you break it into two pieces and you look at the way that they respond to it and you're like, whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute. What? This response is absurd. This doesn't make any sense. And when you start to use a little bit of logic... You start to look at things like that. You start to notice things like that. Anyway, no world would ever make any sense. 
No, I don't think the world... Right now, dude, the world is so topsy-turvy, it's crazy. It reminds me of a famous Chinese curse, and remember the word curse. May you live in interesting times. Yeah, well... And we live in interesting times. That we it's do, a curse. That we do, my friend. We do certainly live in interesting times. But I'm glad that I'm here in the middle of the maelstrom to at least do something about it. It's better than being born in the aftermath and and things are really horrible and you're like, well, I wish I was there to do something about it. Or it happens like a hundred or 200 years after you're around and you're, you're obviously not there to do anything about it either. So at least you're here, I'm here and others are here to at least stand and try to get some sense back into the, the people of this country and the world try to get people to get back in touch with their humanity and love one another. That's how we end this, by the way. That's how we did get rid of this division, getting back into that, because I want to end on a positive note. That's how we get past this. And I'm not saying we all hug, kiss, sing kumbaya, and everything is going to magically go back to being great. But like I saw pictures today in Louisiana of protests, and there were cops and like black women hugging White cops, black women. And you know what? They were hugging. They were embracing each other. As humans, they were praying together for an end to the violence and the killing. I I saw a story where there was a cop talking to somebody in the in a convenience store and a black lady walked in and walked up to the counter and the cop said to her, like, How are you feeling? And you know, she said, oh, I'm whatever, you know, having a good day, whatever. And he said, no, 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 ser- really, how are you feeling? And she said, I'm tired. And he said, me too. And he reached out and he hugged her. And she cried. This was from her account. And she cried. She broke down crying. And she said that, in her words, right then and there, it didn't matter that they were you know, a black guy and a white woman and he was a cop. Or, excuse me, a, a uh, it didn't matter that he was a white cop and she was a black woman it mattered that they were two human beings having this experience and they didn't know each other and yet they were having this very real emotional experience together and that's powerful that we need more of that we need more people to lo- put love out there I, I i've been preaching this for almost well i mean I've been, I've been talking about this since the beginning but i've been preaching this hardcore for like at least almost two years now if not more, where I focus specifically on, you know, putting that vibe out there and shifting even the way I address stuff. And I talked about that on air, on, on air for years now. And, and here that you actually see it in action. And again, it's not kumbaya. It's not some fairy tale, some utopian dream where everybody's going to suddenly get along overnight and all the ills of the world will stop. But we need to come together. That's the biggest problem is we're so divided. We see each other as so different from ourselves that we're disconnected from each other and everything around us. Everything. And that's part of the problem on so many levels. It drives anxiety. It drives fear. You you feel alone. You feel like nobody understands you. We're all in this together. No one's better than anybody else. No one's above anybody else. We're all side by side. Again, doesn't matter what color your paint job is. We all function the same on the inside. We're all humans. We're all just meat-coated skeletons made of stardust cruising through this experience, enlightening our souls. Wake up and look past the division Look and see the person next to you. Appreciate their differences. Respect them for it. Help them to appreciate your differences. And love one another and respect one another for the differences and more so the similarities that we all have in common. A lot of the problems that we have, not only in this country, but in this world will stop. won't be so easy to kill one another when we actually have our humanity back. But of course... We've been dehumanized, so it's easier to send people to fight and kill. That's a whole nother issue. Anyway, John, final thoughts? 
we're only going to succeed in this and we're going to only going to make this out of this as a united nation or as a whole nation based upon what our founders had in mind if we come together and realize that we're all sharing our experiences 90% of our experiences are shared in this country and in this world and if we accentuate the differences constantly we're never going to, we're never going to realize that and we've got to get our police back to the concept of being peace officers and protecting the public and stopping real crime and real problems and stop having the police focus on minor infractions because it, it's when you over enforce minor infractions you're going to cause problems in the community everybody knows it's no big deal if you get a speeding ticket or a traffic ticket or you have a joint everyone knows that's not a big deal so when you take that minor issue and you turn it into a major, major issue and you fast forward that 20, 30, 40 years this is what you end up with you end up with divided society full of anger, hate, mistrust, and anger. And you, you light a match on that powder keg and add in someone who's unstable to it. And you have destruction of our society. And we're only going to fix that as if we come together. And we realize we're not all different. And that's the way we're going to fix this. And uh, in case people out there hadn't heard of it, there's an organization called Oath Keepers that I'm deeply involved with oathkeepers.org that's police officers and firefighters who have reaffirmed their oath to the constitution and the people and it's a powerful organization we've got 25 30,000 members nationwide i think in every single state in the nation and that cop that you see on the road he might just be a good guy in fact he probably is a good guy he might be a great guy so encourage your officers your friends when you make small talk in the coffee shop or in the donut shop or wherever ask them if they're an oath keeper and if they're not just tell them go to oathkeepers.org see what uh, see what your oath is really about you take an oath to uphold the constitution you don't take an oath to uphold a political idea you don't take an oath to uphold a misdemeanor law you take an oath to uphold the constitution of the united states and see if we can't change the change the way we're, we're headed and, and and change the tide. And uh, final final thought thought if you had read it or seen the movie, check out Kill the Messenger. It's about a guy named Gary Webb, and uh, he uh, he uncovered some interesting things about the drug war in the United States, which I think was a initiating spark in the fire that we happen to see where we find ourselves today. Um, powerful movie, powerful book. He was a powerful man. And so, uh, if you want to know the truth about drug war, or at least part of the truth, it's kill the messenger and look up Gary Webb. Thank you very much, John, for taking the time to hang out with us tonight. Well, I had a great time. We need to do it more often. Agreed. Roger that, sir. So, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. There, there he goes. Sergeant John D. Shirley. Amazing individual. Really is. Really good guy. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. We are out of time, so I'm going to end the broadcast right here. As I always tell you, the solutions to our problems are most definitely an inside job. And I know all of you have the capabilities to be superheroes. So go out and be the superheroes that this world so desperately, desperately needs. And do not fall for the fomented division that's being pushed in this country on every level just remember a house divided against itself cannot stand just remember that I love you all ladies and gentlemen go be the change that this world so desperately needs I'm out